So, anybody have questions before we get started? Let's talk about inheritance with comparators. I should probably add sorting to this title, too. Uh, we're going to sort things today. Yes. All right, very quick. Uh, something I haven't mentioned in lecture, but Paul mentions in his, so just to, just to make sure we all have the same content. Uh, you can have a method that takes a generic type. Uh, this code is in the repo, uh, and some, uh, some of you have been asking about it. Uh, this syntax is a method that takes a generic type that's not in a class that takes a generic type. So if you want just one method that takes a generic type without having the whole class take a generic type, you can use this syntax. Put your generic type parameter list right here, where normally it would be right after the name of the class. For a method, it goes right after the access modifier and before the return type. And then you can use your type parameter throughout the method, just like you would in any other method in a class that uses a, uh, a generic type. Uh, so this method, when somebody calls this method, T will be set to whatever matches the parameter types. So if you give it two linked list nodes of strings, T will be string for that method call. And if you give it two linked list nodes of integer, it'll be integer, T will be integer for just that method call. Uh, everything's the same in the memory diagram. If you just pretend that this method works when you call it with two linked list nodes of whatever, uh, you won't be wrong. Your memory diagram will look just the same as if this was a method inside of a class that takes a generic type. Uh, so just to get that out there, and that's it. Just one slide on that. Uh, but I just want to make sure that was mentioned in lecture. Let's talk about comparators. Our problem with this that we want to solve is that we want to compare two values. And that's it. Comparator is going to take two values and tell us their relative order amongst each other as though it were in a full sorted order. So we want to eventually use our comparators to get the full sorted order of any number of values. And we're going to do that by writing code that will only compare two values. So we'll see how to write our comparators first, how to write our comparators that compare two values, and then use that to be able to sort any number of values. Comparators come in two different flavors. Uh, the one you saw last semester, if you took 115 here, um, and I'm pretty sure this is the only flavor that you see in 115, uh, the one flavor returns an int. It's going to take two parameters and return an integer, which is either negative, a negative integer if the first parameter comes before the second, a negative integer if the second parameter comes before the first parameter, and zero if the two values are tied. So if I call uh, a comparator of this type and I want to sort integers in increasing order and I give it the values one and three, it's going to return a negative integer because the first parameter one should come before the second parameter three. If I reverse it and say three and one, it's going to return a positive integer. And if I say one and one, it's going to return zero because their relative order is the same. It doesn't, if I have two ones in a list, it doesn't matter which one I put before the other one, it's still going to be sorted order. The other flavor, and the one we'll see most often this semester, throughout this semester, that we'll build and everything, returns a Boolean. A little bit simpler. If the first parameter comes before the second, it's going to return true. Otherwise, false, including ties. So if they're tied in their ordering, we're going to return false. Uh, this is a little bit simpler to write, simpler to use. This is the one we'll prefer this semester, though we could have easily chose the other one. It wouldn't have been that big of a deal. Oops. Uh, Java mainly does prefer the other, the one that returns an int. A lot of types that we use in Java do have a compare to method included in them. And if you want to compare two values of that type, you call the compare to method and it will return an int. It is the int flavor, not the Boolean flavor. Uh, so this is a little bit different also from what you saw in JavaScript. In Java, the compare to method is a method that is called through an object. So we are still comparing two values, but one of the values is the calling object, which 
will be accessed. The compare to method will access it through the keyword this. It'll have a reference in the keyword this. And then the second is going to be the parameter to the method. So we're going to compare these values, the calling object and the parameter object. And if the calling object comes first, it's going to return a negative int. If the calling object comes after the parameter, it's going to return a positive int. And if they're tied, we're going to return zero. So in this example, one, which is just the character A, compare it to just the character B. A comes before B in alphabetical order, so it's going to return a negative integer to say that the calling object comes before the parameter. One compared to one, so A compared with itself, that's going to be zero. The order, uh, they're tied in the overall ordering. And two, B as the calling object, and one, A as the parameter, that's going to return a positive integer because the calling object comes after the parameter. That should be familiar from JavaScript from last semester. I don't have to belabor it too much. Um, I want to talk about specifically how strings are compared since it's relevant to your homework. You have to compare strings. You have to sort the cast of a movie in, uh, in task five, and you already wrote the test uh, for task four. I, well, I guess we haven't hit the uh, actual deadline yet, so a lot of you are still writing it. But uh, these comparators for strings, the compare to method for strings in Java is going to compare the characters thusly. Uh, it's going to go character, I don't know why I said thusly there. Um, it's going to compare the strings character by character, just like we did in array list. It's going to iterate over the indices of the characters and compare each pair of characters from the strings. And for each character, it's going to check if the characters are different. It's going to re determine you know, whatever character comes first alphabetically. It's going to return that string. That's going to be the string that, uh, that it's going to say this string comes before the other string. If the characters are the same, it just keeps moving on. It moves on to the next character. And if it reaches the end of one string, then the string that ended is the one that comes before the other string. So if one string is the prefix of another string, the one that's a prefix, that comes first, and then the string with extra characters after the prefix, that one's going to come after the other one. So it does favor shorter strings if there's an absolute tie in the entire string. So Java would come before JavaScript in the full order, uh, since it's a prefix. Compare to does care about case, though. We got pretty sidetracked in the first lecture. Hopefully we don't this time. Or if we do, if you're actually interested, then hopefully we do. But um, it, this compare to method actually doesn't sort our strings alphabetically. It sorts them lexicographically, which means each character is going to be converted to its ASCII value, or rather, more accurately, its UTF-8 value, and then sorted based on those values. Uh, for a lot of purposes, you don't have to know all of ASCII or UTF-8, the encodings and everything. Um, but one important thing to note is that in this ordering, all lowercase letters come after all capital letters. So every single capital letter in this sorted order will come before every single lowercase letter, which a lot of times isn't what we want. Most times isn't, isn't what we want. Uh, so, for example, capital Z comes before lowercase a. Um, this can get some really wonky sortings if you're not prepared for this, if you're not, um, not handling this in one way or another. Uh, so what we want, for the homework at least, is to compare, uh, compare our strings while ignoring case, and the hints right in the homework doc pretty much tells you exactly what to do for that. Uh, so I'll leave the conversation at that. But just be aware, compare to does care about upper and lower case. It doesn't actually sort completely alphabetically if the values are in different case. All right, but we want to do the flavor of comparator that returns a Boolean. So we want to compare two values. We're going to take them both as parameters. We're going to take two parameters. And we're going to return true if the first parameter comes before the second and false otherwise, including ties. So this is the style we want to build. Uh, as opposed to 
the int style that you saw in JavaScript that's common in Java as well. A lot of, a lot of built-in types, by the way, have that compare to method. If you want to compare two, uh, two objects to each other, a lot of them have that implemented for you. We're not going to build that. We're going to build the Boolean style. Again, a little bit simpler. Let's write ourselves, ourselves some comparators. But here's a simple comparator. Say uh, we want to sort an array list of integers. And if we just take the default Java sorting and we say, hey, Java, sort these integers, it's going to sort in increasing order. So say we want to break that behavior. We want to do something different. We just want to sort in decreasing order. And now we can sort in all kinds of orders, whatever we can code. But decreasing order, it's a nice, simple example for your first time seeing these things. So we'll stick with the pretty simple one. So this comparator, we want to sort in decreasing, um, decreasing order. First of all, increasing order, the comparator would be the less than operator. For decreasing order, we're just going to switch that to the greater than operator. So if A is greater than B, this would return true. We want to return true when the first parameter comes before the second parameter. So if we return true only when the first parameter is greater than the second parameter, then values that are greater than other values will come first, and we'll get our full decreasing order when we sort using this comparator. Uh, and we're using strictly greater than. We want our ties to be false. So if A equals B, this will return false, which is the behavior that we want from our comparator. Let's build some structure around this. So on this, the previous slide, this is a method. It's a non-static method, and it's not wrapped in a class. Everything in Java has to be in a class. And we're not going to make this static. We could. It would be an option. We'd have to set things up quite a bit different, um, but we wouldn't get to talk about inheritance then. Uh, and we're going to wrap this up in a class. We're going to call it int decreasing, and now we have a non-static method inside a class. And as we know, to be able to test, uh, to be able to call this method uh, for testing for task four, we just talked about it Wednesday, which is why I say we all know. I don't want to belabor the point. Um, but to call this method, we need to create an object of this type. So we have to create a new int decreasing, and then we can call this method. It's an issue here. Again, we talked about this Wednesday, but just to make sure we all got, uh, see what's going on here. Oh, crap, there's no constructor. How are we going to instantiate this thing when there's no constructor? We need to call the constructor to get an object of this type. If there's no constructor, what do we do? Just panic, freak out? No. Uh, when, uh, whenever we don't write a constructor, remember, we get the default constructor. So whenever there's no constructor explicitly written, Java will add a constructor here. You can't have a class in Java without a constructor. You have to have a constructor. If you don't write one, Java's not like, hey, you don't have a constructor. G give me a constructor. What the hell? No, Java's just like, I'll give you one. I'll give you this default constructor I got laying around. I'm not using it anyway. And it's going to give you this default constructor. It'll be public. It'll take no parameters. And it will have no code in the body. That's the default constructor that you get if you don't write any constructor. So whether you write this class or this class, you will have identical functionality. They'll both do the same exact thing, whether you explicitly add the default constructor or you just don't write any constructor and take the default. Uh, for these comparators, we're going to take the default. We're just going to not write our constructor and just use the default constructor. But it is still there. The constructor still exists. And when we get to the memory diagram, we'll see that we have to not forget to add that constructor stack frame because the is called, the constructor is called. And it's inheritance week, ain't it? Let's use some inheritance. So we're going to complicate this a little bit more. We're going to create a comparator class, which is going to take a generic type. And we're going to write a compare method that compares two values of that generic type. Our int decreasing class is going to extend the comparator type. And when we're extending it, we're not just going to extend comparator we're going to extend comparator with a specific type. So we're going to say int decreasing extends comparative integer. So that int decreasing will be a comparator that compares two integer 
values. And then when we override compare, we're going to override it with parameter types that match our generic type that we gave comparator. So all three T's have to match. So whatever I use here, I have to use the same things here and here. Uh, this is, not to, not to harp on this too much, but this is another reason why I like the override parameter. It's easy to miss your types here. If you have uh, doubles here, but integer here, and you don't have an override annotation, your compare method is always going to return false, no matter what code you write in the compare method in int decreasing. Because the types won't match, you won't actually override the method, and you'll just get returned false every single time. Your code will be broken. That one you'll probably find pretty quick, because you know, sorting just won't work. Sorting will break, uh, and then you'll be able to find it. With the override annotation, don't even have to think about it. You get an error. Java's going to say, hey, fix your stuff. You go in there and you fix it. Going from this slide to this slide, I'm switching from int to integer. I want to talk about this one. Int, every single time I've shown any lecture example, I'll always use the primitives before the class types that match the primitive types. Uh, this includes on your homework, we're always going to use the primitives instead of the class types for the primitives, so always int over integer, unless we have to use the class types. So once we use, move to generic types, and I had, we had this conversation when we first talked about generic types, but it, it missed a lot of you. Uh, when we have generic types, we have to use a class type. We have to use a type defined by a class. Integer satisfies that. It's basically ints, but it's a different type. It's a type defined by a class. And if we want a generic type, we have to use a class type. We cannot use the primitives. I'll always use primitives unless I have to, which is in the case of generic type parameters. Uh, so this includes creating like an array list of integer. It'll always be array list of integer, linked list node of integer, uh, a comparator of integer. But other than that, I'm always using the primitive types. Again, including on your homework. Uh, so those of you getting errors on task four, where no matter what you do, you're failing a correct solution, and you go to office hours, and you show your test to the TA or Paul or myself, and everything looks great, everything's fine, check your types. I don't know why so many students are doing this. And it's not a ton, but it's a, enough that it comes up a lot. When the homework document says, write a method that takes an int, and you write a method that takes an integer, that's the wrong type. It's the wrong type. And it causes issues in Autolab, because Autolab's expecting an int, and you're giving it an integer. Uh, there, uh, there's a specific issue on homework, on task two, just the way the grader was set up, it actually did allow, which I wish I could write all the graders to just allow you to use either type, just to avoid all this stuff. Uh, but they are different types. Like I can't write code that takes two different types in Java, one being a primitive and one being a class, too. That's, I don't know how to write that code, to be honest, um, without just writing two completely different graders. Um, I, I've thought about this, actually. I wouldn't just have to write two graders. I would have to write a grader for every combination of primitive and uh, in class type. So if there's five places where you're using ints, uh, I have to write a grader for every combination of a mix of int and integer if I want to allow this. I don't, maybe someday I'll, I'll find a better solution. But uh, I'm not writing 32, I should know my powers of two. I'm not writing 32 graders. Uh, and then running 32, it's going to take 32 times longer to grade your assignments as well. Not doing that. Uh, so use the right type. Uh, I lost my place. Uh, on task two, the grader was, uh, was fine with this. It just didn't catch that, so you would pass task two. And now, some of you, when you're getting to task four, you're running into this bug because the task four grader, and so there's a lot more gr going on with the grading code in task four. And for whatever reason, it is uh, catching that and then crashing on your test when you have the wrong type. So look through your whole project. If you're getting that issue where you're failing a correct solution and you can't figure it out, and even the TAs and Paul and uh, myself can't figure it out. 
well, I know what to look for now, and I've told the rest of them what to look for. But uh, check all your types and make sure you're using int when the homework document says int. Integer is the wrong type. Double with a capital D is the wrong type. It's just it's not what the homework doc asks for. It's not what the spec asks for. And and I don't the reason I I didn't even expect honestly it caught me off guard. I didn't even expect this because why would you? Why are any of you doing that? I, I never expected when the when it says write a method that takes an int for someone to write a method that takes integer. It, it's when you you read the homework doc and you're typing the code. Like, why do you type a completely different thing? I, it catches me off guard. I'm starting to ask people why they do that, and I haven't gotten a satisfying answer yet. My only guess as to why, if you have a better answer, let me know. My only guess as to why anybody would do this is if they didn't write their own code. Uh, so if there is a legitimate reason why some of you are doing that, I would love to hear it, because uh, then I can address it in lecture and avoid it in future semesters. But uh, I want to know why people are doing that. Never expected that. Never expected it. All right. So hopefully that gets some of you. I think of the issue of the task four issues, the frustrating ones. I think that's one of the last ones that's bugging people. Uh, get the right type. Just type the right type that the homework doc asked for. Uh, it's really tricky because it's a homework two uh, task two thing. So the TAs, Paul, myself, we're not even necessarily looking at your task two stuff. That's what makes this one really frustrating for everybody. Uh, for all of us involved, um, but it wasn't even a test test four issue. It was a test two issue that you you got away with in test two. Uh, unfortunately, getting away with things usually catches up to you. Unfortunately, it did in this case. So I got to tighten up my test two grader. Is uh is uh what's got to happen? Uh, all right. I cut that tangent short. Just just long enough for anyone who's hitting that issue to make sure that, that they heard it. Uh, so we can write comparators for other things. Uh, we're going to go back to the int decreasing comparator, just because it's a simpler example to show in lecture. Uh, but I just want to show you, just to prove the point, that you can write comparators for any type. Here's a comparator of type game item. I'm going to extend comparator of game item, and then implement the compare, or sorry, override the compare method to take two game items. And this method is going to sort my game items based on their distance from the origin. So distance of A, I have this helper method. I have it private to encapsulate this method. Nobody in the outside, outside of this class has to care that I wrote a helper method called distance. I'm only writing it so I don't have to cut and paste code when I compute two distances. So I can make that private. The outside world only cares about the compare method, so that one will be public. They don't care how I'm comparing. So let's hide the details. Let's embrace encapsulation. Uh, so compute the distance of each one of them, which uh, is going to be the distance from the origin. I never know what to call this, this way of computing distance, because uh, I've always called it L2 distance, but nobody knows what I'm talking about whenever I say that. Uh, I believe they used Euclidean distance in high school, or maybe they just don't call it anything, and maybe that's the issue. Um, but Euclidean distance, L2 distance, uh, whatever it is, distance in a two-dimensional space, square root of the sum of the squares. Uh, and then I'm going to say, if that distance is less for A than B, then A should come before B. Using this as our comparator is going to sort from distance to the origin. Uh, we could also expand on this. I didn't write an example for it. But if we wrote a constructor for this comparator that takes a reference to a player, then we could sort our values based on their distance to that player, which might be something we want to do in our games, sort all the game items in the game compared to their distance to a particular player. And we can create new comparators with different references to different players. And then sort everything by the distance to that player, and then go through that list, find the closest items. Uh, maybe the closest item, we want to check if the closest items are close enough that the player can interact with them. A lot of things we'll want to do based on how close an item is to a particular player. And sorting all the items can just be more convenient. Go iterate through them until we find an item that's far enough away that we don't care about it, and then skip the rest of the items after that. Can be helpful. So, great. We can compare two values. Now what? We want to compare any number of values. If I have an array list of a billion integers, I want to be able to sort them things. But all I have is the power to compare 
two integers or two game items, what do I do? Well, let's run insertion sort. You should have maybe uh, seen insertion sort. I believe they cover insertion sort, selection sort, and merge sort in 115 these days. Last time I taught 115, that's what we covered anyway. I don't think they've changed anything there. So you should have seen this, but if you haven't, or just as a reminder, uh, let's talk about what insertion sort is, because that's the sorting algorithm we're going to look at today. For insertion sort, we're going to look at each value in the input list that we want to sort. We're going to create an empty output list. And then for each value in the input list, we're going to find where it belongs in the output list and then add it at that location. So here we have the input 165. We're going to consider 1 first. There's no decision to be made of where to insert 1. We're going to insert it just in the output list. The output list is empty, so adding it to the front, the back, the, you know, whatever. It's all the same. It's just inserting it into the empty array list. Now, we're going to use array list for this, by the way. For 6, we have a more work to do because we have some work at all to do. With 6, we're going to use our comparator we're going to pull out our comparator and use that to figure out where to insert 6. So for 6, we're going to go through each value in the output list, which is just 1 at the time. We're going to compare 1 and 6. We're going to ask our comparator, what comes first between 1 and 6? Or rather, does 1 come before 6? And it's going to return false. There this is backwards from the code, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, so that's going to return false. So we know that 1 doesn't come before 6. So therefore, this must be where 6 goes. It must come before that first element that we checked. So we're going to insert 6 before 1 and then push 1 down the array list by one position. For 5, we're going to compare 6 and 5 and ask our comparator, does 6 come before 5? It's going to say, yeah. Yeah, it does. So we're going to move down the list, and we're going to say, does 1 come before 5? The comparator returns false. It says no. So we're going to say, ah, we found where to insert 5. And we're going to insert 5 in between these two values. Push 1 down the array list again, and then we have our full sorted order. So our output, 6, 5, 1, we've sorted all of our values in decreasing order. No, that's not, it's not backwards from the code. I'm just backwards. My brain's backwards. Uh, and so whenever we're inserting a value, we're going to go through the output list until we see false. Or when we get to the code, we're going to see that we're going to go through the entire list and count the number of times that we've seen true. And that's going to be the index of the value that we're going to insert at, that we're going to insert the value at. So depending on how many times we've seen an element that comes before the one we're inserting, we're going to keep going down the list uh, that many times. This works because the output list will always be sorted. All the, all the while through this entire algorithm, output will always be sorted. So we're going to check our elements until there's one that comes after, that doesn't come before the value we're inserting. That tells us where to insert. Insertion sort. It's one of our slow n squared, o of n squared algorithms. But it works well in a conversation with comparators because it's not too complicated. So here's our not too complicated method. Uh, there's a bit going on here. It, it would take you a while to stare at it and piece apart everything that's going on. So we're going to spend a little bit of time piecing this apart. So let's take a look at our insertion sort code and see how this is working and what's going on with it. First. We have a sorter class that has a constructor that takes a comparator of type T, and our sorter class takes a generic type T. The constructor is going to take a comparator of T and then store it in an instance variable. So some setup here. We have a type parameter, so when we create a sorter, we're going to create a sorter of a particular type and then give it a comparator for that type. Now, this gives us a lot of power and a lot of benefit. So when we take a generic type T, 
this sorting class, which specifically this sort method that we're concerned about, can sort any type in Java. It can sort any type. Aside from our primitives, it can sort any single type because it takes a generic type. So we write our sorting code one time, and this one method can sort any type at all, any type, again, aside from our primitive types. We have to use our, our, uh, you know, our class types for those, the box types. Furthermore, it takes a comparator. So we can't just sort every, we don't just get the power of sorting any type. We write this sorting code one time, and we use this comparator every time we need to compare two values, and we can sort any type in any way possible. For int, we just wrote the one comparator, the int decreasing. We could add our int increasing if we want to use this code for the uh, default sorting order. Uh, we could write a comparator that sorts by absolute value. We could write a sorter that re sorts by how far away a number is from a perfect square. I, I don't know. We can come up, anything we can come up with in code, we can write a comparator for it. So we can sort these things in any way also. Uh, more, more useful for a game item. We can sort our game items by distance from the origin, distance from a player. We can sort them by uh, how close they are to each other, which game item has another game item closest to it. We can sort in any way we want, whatever makes sense for our specific application, for specific feature that we're building in our game. This is a very powerful concept. This is maximum flexibility. We write one sorting method ever, and we can sort anything in any way by taking a type parameter and a comparator of that type. This is true for any language you've written, uh, any language you've written code in. Python, JavaScript, Java, they all have sorting methods, sorting uh, code built into the language. They write that code one time. And you can sort anything with it. You just give it the generic type and the comparator, and you can sort anything anyway. Without the Java developers, without having to ring them up and be like, hey, uh, I got this game item class. Uh, can you write me a new sorting algorithm? Nah, we ain't got to do that. We just write a comparator and then uh, give them our game, uh, game objects. Did I say game object? Game items. It was called game object at one point. Uh, they write the method one time. They spend a lot of time making sure it's fast, efficient, clean, uh, not necessarily clean, some of them get pretty complex, but uh, tested. They write a lot of tests for that. They write it once, they make it great, they test it once, and then everybody on the planet can use it forever for any type in any ordering. That's what we want, that's what we want out of our code. Uh, we don't wanna be cut and pasting this sorting method every single time we wanna sort things. That'd be tedious and Awful. So this gives us maximum flexibility. When we write our sorting method itself, we're going to work with ArrayList. We're going to have the input ArrayList. By reference, we get a reference to an ArrayList. The ArrayList is going to be of type T, so whatever type matches the comparator that we got in the constructor, that's the only thing we can sort with this sorting method for a particular object. If we want to sort a different... Uh, different type, we just say new sorter and give it a different comparator, comparator of a different type. We can create as many objects of type sorter as we want. But we get a reference to an array list. We create an output array list. And we kind of have a choice here. Some sorting methods will sort the input that you're given and then return void. Uh, we do have that option. It's a little tricky to do with insertion sort. It doesn't make too much sense. But selection sort, it would make more sense. Uh, but we could do that. This is something we need to be careful about, though. At least we have to think through and make our decisions wisely. Uh, you might want to do that. You might not want to. Um, not just with sorting, but for any code you write. When your parameter is a reference to an object on the heap, you have the power to go to the heap and modify that object and have side effects of your method. And you have to be careful about that, because if whoever's calling your method, which for your homework, you know, a lot of times it's you, or maybe my testing code, and things like that. But uh, whoever's calling your method might not be expecting the object to change when it hands you that reference. It says, hey, here's my reference. 
take good care of it, and then you take that reference, run over to the heap, and just change everything and muck everything about. It can mess up other code because your method had side effects. Uh, so be aware of that. Just you know, throughout your career, this is general programming advice. Uh, throughout your career, be aware of that. So we're not going to change the input. We're not going to modify the input at all. We're just going to treat that as read only. Uh, we're just going to read these values. We're not going to change them at all. Uh, this is one thing different. Um, Scala, in most cases, didn't let you change the parameters. Um, there were, I don't have to get into it. But uh, most of the time, it didn't let you change the parameters. So coming back to Java, I have to make sure I say these things in lecture again. Uh, I forgot that this was such an issue. Uh, I'm always in the habit, even when you can change the parameter, just don't. Don't change it. You're just asking for bugs. Don't change it. Uh, so we're not going to touch input. We're going to create output and just treat input as read only. So, but be careful in general, unless that is the feature you want. Sometimes we have methods that you want to have side effects. For example, every setter we've ever written, that, those methods have side effects. We do actually want those methods going over to the heap and making changes. But be aware that if you don't want that behavior, don't accidentally build that behavior. All right, and finally, the algorithm. Let's go through the whole algorithm right here. We'll go through the memory diagram as well, but just to give an overview. We're going to iterate over all of the values in the input array list. We're going to keep track of the location of where we're going to insert the next, uh, insert this value into the output. So this is going to be the index where we're going to insert this value from the input where we're going to insert it into the output list. We're going to iterate over all the values in the output list. We're going to call our comparator. Oh, I didn't update this with my this dot. I think I did in the memory diagram. Uh, we're going to ask our comparator, hey, does the, this value from the output list come before the value in the, uh, the value that we're inserting from the input list? If it returns true, we're going to increment location. So what we're effectively doing is counting the number of values in the output list, uh, array list. I keep saying list, but I mean array list when I say list in today's lecture, at least. We're going to count the number of values in the output array list that come before, strictly before, the value from the input list that we're inserting. And that will be exactly the index where we want to insert that value. So we count the number of times our comparator returned true with the output value as the first parameter. And that will be exactly where we want to insert this thing. And then finally, we're going to add that value at that location. Uh, so this is an overloaded add method that ArrayList has. Instead of just giving it the value that we want to assert, insert, which we've done so far, which would add it to the end of the ArrayList, we're going to give it a, another argument, which is going to be the index at which we'll insert the value. And this will, of course, add that value at that index. And whatever was at that index and beyond is going to get moved down by one in the array list. So we don't overwrite anything. We're going to move everything else down the array list, but get this value at this location. Okay. Any questions so far? I haven't really stopped for questions today. Chat's pretty quiet, too. So I'm assuming y'all just don't have questions? Question mark. Everyone feeling all right about this so far? A decent amount of material, but I, there's no, I don't think there's a new concept today. It's applications of things we've seen. So I'm assuming that it goes down fairly easy. If not, please let me know. Because uh, the next thing will be a little bit of a new concept, but I'm going to kind of skip it. So we have kind of an issue right here. We need to create a new sorter. We're going to call this constructor, which takes a comparator of type t. And we're going to give it a reference to a new int decreasing, which is, of course, of type int decreasing. So the, the constructor takes a parameter of type comparator. We gave it a reference to an object of type int decreasing. You can't do that. Right? These types don't match. Types don't match. I've been saying for six weeks you can't do that. 
that was a strongly typed language, you can't do this, right? But we actually can. In this case, we can do this. Uh, the reason is int decreasing extends comparator. So wherever we could use a comparator, we can either give it a comparator or any type, an object of any type that extends comparator, either directly or indirectly. So if we have something that extends comparator, we can give it to this constructor that takes a comparator. This is, that in a nutshell is polymorphism. We have a whole week to talk about polymorphism later in the semester, so I'm gonna cap this discussion right here. For now, just suffice that, to know that this is legal, this works, this is allowed, and it's a very powerful concept in OOP that we're gonna talk about later in the semester in great detail. So this is allowed. It's polymorphism, but you're not expected to, to really understand. Uh, we kind of needed it for what we're using comparators for. Um, so it kind of pops up, but you don't really have to understand polymorphism yet, except that our comparators work this way. Like everything works, it compiles, it runs on your quiz. If you get a comparator question, don't write this, don't compile, QED, don't write that kind of stuff, uh, which we've had in the past. Not with that specifically, but um, the quiz code is, I don't want to go on this tangent. It, it's, uh, it'll compile. It, I, I'll say it's intended to compile. Uh, if there's a typo, go with it and write your memory diagram best you can. I don't think we've had a typo that doesn't compile in a long time, but um, it is a typo. We're not tricking you on those. They're not trick questions where the answer is it doesn't compile. Uh, we're not throwing those at you on quizzes. All right, memory diagram. So let's memory diagram this thing. So hopefully this is familiar from 115. Again, I hope I don't have to harp on this point. But we're calling a constructor, we're calling a method where its argument is not a value, it's an expression. So we have to evaluate the expression before, to a value before we can call the other method. So we do have to call new int decreasing before we call new sorting. So this is going to go on our stack first. And if you don't want to remember all that, just think about math whatever's inside the parentheses goes first. So we're gonna evaluate what's ever inside the parentheses first. So int decreasing is going to be the first thing on our memory diagram. And we've got a few things to talk about here. Uh, int decreasing, remember, it doesn't have an explicit constructor, so it gets the default constructor that does still have to go on your memory diagram. I don't think we're gonna throw this at you at, on a quiz, but if, uh, if it does show up on a quiz, your default constructor call does still have to go on your memory diagram. And don't forget that super constructor as well. Here we have a default constructor. And we saw that with any constructor, if you don't put a super constructor call and the super class has a constructor that doesn't take any parameters, that super constructor call is also automatic. So we have an automatically added default constructor, which automatically calls another default constructor that was inherited from comparator. So we do still have two constructor calls here, even though there's no constructor code in either of these classes. Make sure those both get on your memory diagram, even when there's no explicit constructors defined. We get two default constructor calls. Int decreasing doesn't have any instance variables. It's the first time we've seen an object like that. Nothing special, we're just gonna have no, uh, no name, no values in the object on the heap. There's just nothing in there. But we still put it on the heap, as opposed to a code block with no variables declared in it. We wouldn't draw the code block. We do still have to draw the object, because we wanna work with this reference and pass this reference around our code. We need that object on the heap. And, uh, just a reminder of this, I said this probably enough times, I'll stop saying it, but our return arrows, if the value that's returned isn't stored in any variable, we don't need our return arrow. Uh, where would our return arrow go? It goes into a new stack frame that doesn't even exist yet. Would we draw the stack frame? I don't know. I don't know what we would do. Just no return arrow if the value's not being stored in a val uh, variable. The only exception to that was with recursion, where the return arrow pointed to the uh, stack frame that called, made the recursive call. Those are our only exception to that so far. Then we can call our sorter constructor. Nothing too special here, we've seen this stuff. 
Uh, here we do have a return arrow because the sorter constructor is returning something into a variable. So we do have our return arrow here. We're going to create a new array. When it's Java internal code, we can't see the array list constructor anywhere in the code you're given. So it doesn't go in our memory diagram. You don't have to draw any code that's internal to Java. We don't expect you to memorize what, uh, what local variables are declared in the array list constructor stack frame. You, it's not a memorization course. Uh, so we just don't draw it at all in our memory diagram. We just get list, get it equal to our new array list. And finally, we get to our call of sort. Uh, this is where things get a little logistically trickier for your memory diagrams. I'm going to draw my stack frame this big because I have the benefit of foresight. I know exactly how much room I'm going to need. On your memory diagrams, there is a little bit of guesswork now. I always recommend not drawing the bottom of your stack frames until you're done with it. Uh, but here, we're going to get a situation where we need new stack frames down here. So you do have to kind of cap it off and uh, kind of have a little bit of foresight to figure out how much space to give each stack frame. It gets a little trickier. We're going to create our output empty array list. We're going to enter this loop. So we have our dashed box. We have some variables being initialized. And then we're going to completely skip over that next loop. So this loop is iterating all, over all the values in output. Output is this array list. There's nothing in it. It's an empty array list. So this loop does not execute it a single time. It's never executed. We just skip to the end. We call add 0, 1. So we want to add the value 1 at location 0, at index 0. Loop around again. Location gets the value 0. Technically, there is a new variable being declared here. If you want to talk about that, I'd be happy to talk about it. But uh, we're just going to cross out the value and reuse the same location in the stack uh, whenever this is the case, when inside a loop, a variable is being redeclared for each iteration of the loop. Our, we're moving from 1 to 6 as our value to insert. Now we're going to loop over the values in our output list, which is just 1. And here we finally get a comparator call. We're going to call value to compare, value to insert. We get a stack frame outside of all other stack frames. New stack frames go on the bottom of your stack below all other stack frames, as opposed to code blocks, which go inside each other. We nest code blocks. They're in the same stack frame. A new stack frame is a completely isolated portion of the stack. This method, this compare is going to return false. So we don't increment location, and we add 6 at index 0, push 1 down the array list. 